welcome to the new year of 2020. Doesn't that have a real ring to it? Um, I'm here today with Dave Cantrell, our NWSA uh, Programs Director, and Chuck Bargeron, our guest for today. And my name is Randy Welsh. I'm the Executive Director for the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. And we're glad to welcome you to our first webinar of the 2020 um, year. And um, I think we, we, before we start with today's webinar about wild spotter, I uh, just wanted to let you know that we've got a, a complete full lineup of webinars planned for this year that we hope will meet the needs of the wilderness stewardship community. Um, just to give you kind of a preview, uh, next week, Kevin Cannon, one of our stalwart uh, Forest Service partners, is going to be talking about wilderness volunteers, some of the, the things that they should be doing, should not be doing, and um, some practical tips on how to work well with the Forest Service. And we have, uh, in March, we'll be um, having the Leave No Trace um, program come on and talk about an update of some of the latest things that are going on with Leave No Trace. And then in April, uh, we will have a panel from the Great Old Broads talking about some of the work that they're doing um, and women in leadership. So that should be an interesting look at a different facet of wilderness stewardship. So today, we're fortunate to have Chuck Berger on with us. Chuck is the co-director for the Center of Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health at the University of Georgia. And Chuck has been instrumental in helping to develop the application that we're going to talk about today, a wild spotter, which is an invasive species um, phone application that you can use for the survey and incorporation of invasive species information that can then be rolled up nationally for use at broader scale analyses. Um, it has great functions and features that we'll let Chuck describe for the local manager, but it will, we'll also want to hear about how this information can then be used at a national level for broad scale um, planning and um, actions that will help us to eradicate invasive species. We all know that invasive species are one of the, the top topics um, that we deal with in wilderness management as we try to provide for ecosystem health and the resilience of the natural systems um, in this time of climate change trying to get a handle on invasive species is always very difficult and challenging so um, dave before we dive in anything you want to add just to say thanks to chuck looking forward to this update a terrific presentation at this time last year uh, a great app and one that i think is going to be a very a very big benefit to many different people and fun to use and anxious to hear about what's new okay well wild spotter started out 12 years ago or sorry three years ago 2018 the summer uh, and let's let's have chuck tell us all about it so chuck take it away sounds good um well yeah just a second chuck i'm i'm making you the presenter right now that's what i was looking for um there you go it's on its way perfect all right, so yes, I am um, Chuck Bardron. I'm um, co-director here at the University of Georgia and and manage the Wild Wild Spotter project. Um, the Wild Spotter is a is a partnership between the University of Georgia, um, the U.S. Forest Service, and and Wildlife Forever. Um, and so that partnership um, started a couple of years ago with the goal to really use volunteers within the national forest system um, to build this map of where invasive species or all tax invasive species are um, on the ground with a particular focus on the um, the more remote the wilderness areas within within those forests um, so we started we launched kind of as a soft launch in um, in the summer of 2018 um 
we launched with 12 pilot forest um, and and here's the the list and kind of the geography of where those those pilot forests um, were we've added um, additional forest um, since since that kind of as a you know opportunistic there was a forest they were doing some work and they were very interested in getting included so we've added them um, and we have some others that are in the pipeline um, to add and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through um, so the, the original forest um, span they, they were identified by the different regions they span um, through different parts parts of the country um, and then we added some of these others um, for particular projects or particular things we were doing um, after we added the forest we we were working with the bureau of indian affairs and um, there were some tribal lands within within montana that were very interested in getting included so we initially added um added seven um, of the tribal lands within within montana and then also a group in minnesota that came to us and, and wanted to be included and so we included them as well um, so that was kind of our first spinoff of, of wild spotter into um, into area outside the forest service um, and, and we're looking at exploring some other opportunities along those lines um, I mentioned some other forests in the pipeline. These are some of the ones that um, that are going to be launched this year as we um, as we move forward with the expansion. Um, and and as we talk about this today, um, you know, I really want. Um, we got a lot of good feedback last year when we did this this webinar for for this group, and I, I think this is one of our most important partners. And so. If there's a forest nearby to where you work um, that, you, that you have a relationship with that, that works going on in that forest, then please reach out to me um, um, or, or Rachel with my group um, after the webinar, and we'll be glad to um, to get your to get your national forest um, national um, added to the uh, to the app and and move that forward. Um, so a little bit of um, of an update on where we're at um, in in this you know first two year period we've had 585 um, records submitted um, that's been from 37 different reporters um, focused on 47 different invasive species so a good a good variety um, most all of those records have now been reviewed and are publicly available. Um, as part of the EdMaps um, national database, um, and, and that's a pretty good percentage for a, a, a citizen science project like this. Um, we've still got some that that we're trying to get some more information about, and um, still need to be be reviewed. But you know, we know that building a system like this is is not something that that is a success overnight, and so we're pleased with the way. Way things are going so far. Um, the website um, we've had over 6,300 um, visitors to the website um, and, and close to uh, 22,000, 21,000 um, page views of the website. So it's starting to get picked up um, with searches and starting to get. Um, um, we're, we're definitely seeing an increase to the traffic. Um, our Facebook page has been. Um, has been very successful in just kind of building that community. Um, we now have um, 3,700 folks that are following um, Wild Spotter on Facebook, and we've reached as many as is almost 200,000 when we were really um, um, pushing this um, last last spring as a as a way to get um, more people involved and more people aware um, of the project. And the, the real success has been getting different partners involved and um, and so we've got 57 different partners now um, that are that have reached out to us everything from elementary schools that want to be involved um, to the typical invasive species organizations um, to some private agencies um, or private companies and and nonprofit 
groups. So um, definitely making a lot of progress on that and just building that those partnerships. Um, we are trying to message everything using the standard invasive species messaging, um, play clean go and clean drain dry, um, don't move firewood and don't let it loose. So one of the key things as we started this was to, to be you know, engaged with these other groups that are doing these um, prevention um, messages and make sure they're included into um, everything we do with Wild Spotter. So I want to quickly go go through some of this. You know, we we look at Wild Spotter as as this website that you know is kind of the the, the project core along with the app, um, and the website has the information about the different areas. Um, the way you can get that basic information, um, and then we we built the app and the website on top of the EdMaps platform, which was an existing platform um, within um, this run out of the University of Georgia. And so the Wild Spotter is that is that tool to get to get things focused on these favorite wild places um, into this this EdMaps database. We've done a lot of marketing and promotion. That's where um, Wildlife Forever has come in as our partner. Um, and that has been both print ads that have gone out in different magazines, as well as um, as well as the social media campaigns, and and then really reaching outside and speaking to groups different than what we normally did. Um, we found that the invasive species community likes to talk to each other about what you're doing, but that's not who the audience of this of this tool is. The audience of this tool is is the people who are doing outdoor recreation, the people who are on the ground, and when they see something unusual, then they report it, and then they know that something has happened um, after that report. And that's where we've been we've been really working to build these volunteer bases. Um, we've had some some field days at some of the forests where local partners have stepped up and said, "Hey, I'm going to do this wild spotter field day." And we've sent them some materials to help help with that happens, and we hope to ultimately get, <coughs> excuse me, um, conservation core partners at many of the different forests to really help make sure the volunteers are engaged and 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 built on some of those areas where we don't have. Um, good volunteer groups already in place. So every forest that, that has been added, we we work with them to include species that are important to that forest and areas that are important to that forest. So, you know, here's an example of one of the forests. We identified these priority wilderness areas and wild and scenic rivers, put together a list of species that, that, that people can look for within the forest and then also potential pathways and vectors for where things, new things could come in. Um, the Wild Spotter webpage was built um, to be very graphically engaging. And, and so we've tried to, you know, show different aspects of recreation, um, whether it be camping all, all the way to hunting and, and really engage those different groups. Um, and looked at what a lot of other conservation organizations and, and websites looked like and how they worked and tried to mimic a lot of that behavior. Um, and then as you go through the different pages to where to look, a lot of this is just getting that general information about what invasive species are, where you find them, um, and, and you know what their, their potential um, are, a list of all the species that are included um, within the project, information about the different places that we're focused on, um, information highlighting our different partners, and then ways that, you know, as a, a good citizen within, um, within these forests, um, what you can do to help prevent, um, prevent invasive species coming in. And so we, 
you know what what we see wild spotter as is not just this um you know data collection tool but also this educational campaign that can help um help promote good behavior on the ground and, and i keep saying forest because that's where our focus has been but everything that we've done has been purposely vague and, and focused on wild places versus national forest. And, and we did that. So when we have other groups come to us and, and want to be part of, of Wild Spotter, whether it be, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service or whether it be a state um, land management agency, then all the language that's throughout the Wild Spotter website and app all works whether you're talking about a forest a national forest a state forest or a um, or a park of some sort um, made it very easy for partners to register and, and and it's amazing how how many partners unsolicited partners we've gotten as well as as well as ones we've really targeted um, to, to be part of part of the project and and it's really just you know being part of this campaign that um, that is a, a um, you know educational as well as an action oriented campaign. Um, the wild spotter, uh, when you go into one of the wild places, you're given a map of the wild place as well as more information about the wild place and the species that are found on that wild place. Um, one of the things that we are building into the next release that's, that's going to come out sometime this spring and summer is a way to actually see the existing um, invasive species reports that the Forest Service has on on the, these national forests and so when you report something you'll be able to see what's already around you and you won't you know you won't waste your time reporting something that's already a known population um, but but be able to check and say yeah I saw that it was still here um, as well as identify things that um, that have not been identified before um, the real key is the smartphone app, um, um, and, and I've got the numbers of downloads, about 725 iPhone and 418 Android um, downloads, pretty good based on the, um, the number of reports we've seen come through and, and, the, num and the website traffic. Um, it, it works on both platforms. Um, we've tried to make it as, as basic and as user-friendly as possible. You open it up, it gives you a little bit of introduction about Wild Spotter. You pick your wild place. Um, we use kind of consistent graphics as on the website. And then, you know, you're able to change your wild place if you travel between different forests. And then all of the records you take are saved into a queue that then allows you to upload them when you get back somewhere that has sailor coverage. So we purposely made everything where it would work offline so you could collect data when you were outside of cellular coverage and then, um, you know, save that to a queue that then would be uploaded when you are back on, um, I say, you know, back on Wi-Fi or cellular service. Um, made it very easy to create an account, um, view information about species, some pictures about the species, and then report the species. Um, very simple reporting form, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more as as we as I go through. Um, and then again, the basic information about about the wild the wild place. Um, all of this data is um, we're encouraging photographs to go along with with each of the reports, and all of this data is being shared back to the Forest Service um, Enterprise database, so it goes in their queue for their treatments and, and follow up. And, and we hope to ultimately provide a feedback loop to, um, to the users once action has been taken so they know that action has been taken on, on what they're doing. Um, one of the things that, that we really focused on with the pilot forest and why we kind of went the pilot forest um, route was we provided each of the pilot forest with a um, with some incentives, some stickers, some pins, um, some hats, some things that they could help help um, recruit volunteers and reward volunteers with with what they've done. Um, also, Rachel Carroll, who um, 
who I'm the substitute for for the presentation today, um, has been working as the coordinator on this project and working with each of the forests um, to answer questions and, and provide them any information they need um, to help move the project along. Um, and and for for example, um, one of the things that they created was a um, an invasive species bingo game. And so um, for a citizen science um, conference that they were um, that Rachel and, and Rebecca that that work in the office here were involved in, um, you know, they had this booth, they had a game, and so they put pictures of different invasive species throughout the conference and people could play the bingo game um, and, and try to, you know, see all the pictures of the different invasive species. And, you know, that has now been something that we've been able to loan out to different forests when they have events and, and make available um, wider. Uh, mentioned Facebook already, that's, that's really been a good, um, a good example of, of a way that we've been able to connect to a lot of people and, and really build the audience. Um, here are some of the other promotional materials that we've built. Um, the rack cards, brochures, pens, um, the stickers seem to be um, something that, we, that we've really um, gotten a lot of interest with and it's good advertising when somebody takes and, and sticks a sticker on a water bottle and then they see the wild spotter um, information and go hey what's that so it's one of those um, benefits that you can um, you know kind of free free advertising um, the posters or something we created laminate laminated ones so they could go up at trailheads and and on signs and, and kind of weather that um, and and that's something that we got some feedback on and and, and we're going to build some additional um, additional um, resources kind of in that similar vein. Um, it was interesting. We, we got some feedback on the project. Um, um, most of it was positive. You know, they liked the part fact that it was part of the EdMaps platform. If they knew what the EdMaps platform was, um, you know, it was a useful tool. Um, you know, however, there were some concerns about, you know, what's different than, I, than for WildSpotter and iNaturalist. Um, you know, there's a lot of apps out there, and this is just just another one. And then the the most interesting thing was why not add more more fields? Well, you know, and I, and I've easily um, thought that was a good one because we're trying to purposely make this easy for people to collect data. And then one of the the feedback is, hey, but we want to be able to collect more data fields. So. Um, um, and, and and obviously that is limited to national forests, and I thought that was a good thing. So one of the things was, you know, looking at Wild Spotter and looking at iNaturalist, and I wanted to take a few minutes today to kind of talk about those differences. So Wild Spotter, the goal is to enable these volunteers, you know, to build this national um, um, comprehensive map of, of of where invasive species are. You know that there's educational campaign. You know we're we're really you know a, a fully integrated system where while while our naturalist is really just an app. You know there's a website that shows the data, but it's really just looking at people recording nature as a general in general. Um, and you know there's usefulness for both of these tools. But, but what we're trying to do with Wild Spotter is use it as an education tool to the problem of invasive species, not just collecting bio, biodiversity information. And, and, and that is where we really said, okay, well, let's, let's really look at what the differences are. And before Wild something is done within Wild Spotter, it's reviewed by a professional or a manager. Um, we really look at you know, focusing on the wild places versus opening to everything. Um, we have an alert system built in through the EdMaps platform where you can, um, where you can, you know, sign up to receive information about where these reports come in. Um, there's no coordinate privacy within WildSpotter, but that's because we're focused on these public lands. Um, and we have multiple map types that are available. Um, as well as kind of standardized ways that we're looking at the data. 
Um, and so, you know, we, we've had continuing conversations between our two programs. Um, we think they both serve a unique need and, and both can can have their benefits and usefulness for um, for different applications. Um, and just an example, you know, when to kind of put it in 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 areas, you've got a forest that's interested in a particular species and their wilderness areas, and so they're going to help, you know, recruit their hunt their backcountry hunters, anglers, and hikers to become wild spotter volunteers and to look in this case for for English ivy on the the Chose National Forest in Oregon. Um, I mentioned the bingo game. Um, we're also looking at, um, with the next app released this spring, changing the quantification for the species to be, okay, well, was, you know, if you're looking at a plant, was the infestation the size of a basketball? Was it more like the size of a, of a car or, or a desk, you know, or was it the size of a school bus? So, you know, for these new infestations, a, a way to gauge how big it is without having to know, measure how many square feet or how many acres a, or partial acres a, an infestation was. And, and, and then have, having a fact sheet available to really explain um, what those are, but make the app a lot easier for people to use. Um, the other concept that I thought was great was, um, was building um, far specific um, watch um, posters. So they would have something very similar to what we were talking about with the, um, you know, advertising wild spotter trail posters, but, but posters that could be put up um, at, at trailheads really promoting the different species that are um, currently a problem. And so we started building those and are going to be um, making those materials available to the forest where they can um, print those out and, and put those up and even change them out through time. And then putting a QR code um, at the bottom to encourage people to, um, to download the app. Uh, one of the things I would like to do, and, I, and I'm really trying to push this concept, is, um, is, is having these boot brush stations. Um, some of you may have seen some of those, um, usually branded with Play Clean Go, um, and so I, I, I'm trying to push this concept of let's co-brand these boot brush stations, come up with a consistent message, and have it where we're training both the um, the good behavior for Play Clean Go as well as what you can do about it using the Wild Spotter platform. And so, um, I, you know, I, I'm hoping that that's something that um, we can get more buy-in and get people to really um, engage in putting these boot brush stations um, at trailheads uh, across public lands with these consistent messages on them. Um, we're working on some badges, um, um, really focused at, at, at a younger generation that is really interested in um, gamification type concepts where we can have, um, you know, ways to reward virtually people for um, for doing things and then have those as, as part of the app. Um, so, you know, I, I really, you know, I know I've repeated some of the information we talked about last year, um, but I, I really wanted to, um, to talk to you again today so we could talk about um, if you've used WildSpotter, what you like um, or what you didn't like about it, uh, where you would like to see us go, what features you would like um, to see us add. And then if you had, um, you know, favorite places that had not been added, um, you know, give you the opportunity to reach out to us and, and make sure that, especially on the forest side, that we got those national forests added before um, before field season kicks in this year. Um, so I will put up um, the contact email address um, that that you can, um, it's mappinginvasives at um, gmail.com. Um, you can reach reach us at directly about the Wild Spotter Project and, um, and then open it up for any discussion and um, questions or comments you may have about the program or, or suggestions on where you would like to see us go.
Hey, Randy, this is Dave. I'm not hearing you. Yes. Yeah, no. thanks, Dave. It's the old problem with the mute. Um, so, so thanks, everybody. Now that we got the mute taken care of, we can um, go ahead and ask and answer some questions. Um, so, Chuck, this was a marvelous question that Ivana Phelps had asked, and I'll go ahead and repeat it here. Uh, for the update in the spring summer, where would the pre-existing data that is projected on the maps come from? NRRS, NRIS, and other EDMAPS data. Also, is there guidance on how the wild spotter data is dumped into TESP-IS? Is that via NRM? Yes. Let, let, let's let's um, let's add as many. Um, uh, acronyms as we can but but yes so the um and and you you've named them better than i can um doing it but yes the the data that was is in the nrss system that has been loaded into edmaps um will be part of the package so yes you would be able to download for each wild place the data that exists within EdMaps for that wild place um, and, and it would be a package that you could download um, and so if there was if there was EdMaps data in addition to the Forest Service data then we would that would be available as well you would be able to choose that wild place download the data and then the data would be available um, on, on the map um and we have not done that data share back to the forest service yet um mainly because other than for testing purposes mainly because the, we didn't feel like the volume of data was quite there yet um but yes it is it is going to go in to um to the main forest database system um it, and the mechanism, I guess, is still to be determined. Um, my plan was to get through another year and then that would make sense to, to put the data um, in at that point. And we can okay. talk more about that if, if we need, if okay. I need to. So Chuck, I think there's um, very much interest in your conservation partners. So could you describe the role of your conservation partners again as to what specifically they're doing? with the wild spotter app and with the publics around wild spotter and then how do new groups uh, consider enrolling for a conservation partnership with you yeah absolutely and and um i, I will definitely say that that what a partner does is varied um and and that just sometimes comes by the nature of these kind of partnerships um but but conceptually you know when a group is supportive of what what we're doing um, with the wild spotter campaign then they can sign up on the website to become a partner um, we have been um, um, sending out materials to at least the initial group of partners we sent out some promotional materials um, for them to use in in promoting um, promoting the wild spotter project um, and, and we're going to continue to do that as as we have the materials to to um, to send out um, but the hope is that you know our logo and we, we add their logo and their information to the wild spotter website and then you know that that's done in return in terms of in some way depending on what the group is and how it's appropriate um, to share information about the program with their their users and their contacts. And that could be through, you know, doing webinars such as this one, or if, you know, it's a magazine and they've got extra space and, and could run an ad um, in the magazine, um, or, or just in some ways when it's like a Department of Agriculture, just showing that, you know, they're in support of this, then when a group within the state goes, well, hey, am I working on this? But is, you know, Montana Department of Ag you know, engaged and involved in this, then then by showing that that group or an invasive species councils 
um, engagement is, is a good way to describe that. So it, it okay. varies, but it varies because our partners are varied. Um, you know, I, for the schools that have, have, have asked to be included, you know, it's really, really a way for us to recognize them and then in return, you know, them collect data on their local national forest. Okay, well, speaking of the local local forest, local unit, so um, would you describe some more about how the information that's collected locally can be used locally? What sort of reports are generated or access to maps that are generated that could be used in developing local um, area um, invasive species eradication and inventory reports? Yeah, absolutely. So it it um, you know when 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 we add a new wild place to um, to Wild Spotter, then what we ask for is you know not only a list of um, of of um, species that they're interested in including, but also what um, you know who the contact needs to be for. That local wild that wild place. So as soon as a new report of an invasive comes in to Wild Spotter, then that local contact is emailed that report. So you know where they can pull the data out of Ed Maps and they can generate maps and they can generate a report of what was found. Um, really, where it's the the real goal is to have that immediate contact with with the um, immediate alert notification of somebody at the forest so if it is something of high priority that something could be done quickly and if it's not then at least they know about it and they know that data is there and they can go back and 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 pull it later you know either directly from wild spot or ed maps or when it gets loaded back into the forest service database okay um, so chuck have you had any discussions with the Forest Service Washington office about how the Wild Spotter app can be incorporated into the wilderness stewardship performance elements for invasive species for wilderness areas? Is there a way to, um, you know, give the agency some credit for using it or for, um, you know, the app, the information that's gathered through the app uh, put into practice for eradication and, and other sort of information request yeah so so i am um so you know yes um mike illamini with the um who's the national invasive species um program coordinator um is is working we're working very closely with him um on this project he, he had a conflict today and was not able to um to make this webinar but um that would be a question for him, um, just because I'm I'm not aware of. That's not a conversation that that him and I have had because that would be a conversation that would be had with you know internally within the Forest Service, um, and doesn't you know requ I guess require what we're our part of the project to you know the data is there and if it can be used as part of the assessment, for, um, then. Um, then obviously from my standpoint, I would say, yes, it's great, but that seems like it's more of a Washington office policy question that um, I can't speak for the Forest Service on that. Certainly understand that. Uh, so the, I'd be the, glad the to customer, try, the, but... yeah, yeah. So the, um, the trailhead posters that you've produced, is there a um, customizable feature associated with wild spotter is it is are those posters on a template that the local area local partner can create or the local unit can create or is that something that that requires a connection with the university of georgia your center to develop yeah so so we started creating them at the request of um a few of the forests that wanted them um and so, um, but we can provide a template to anybody that would like to have one. Um, you know, we just, we were doing it to 
as a way to support the local forest. But if the expertise and ability is there, then um, then yeah, those those material any any of those materials can be made um, available. Just send us an email, and we'll be glad to give you. I, I think they're using. Um, uh, Adobe InDesign, but we probably could do a um, Microsoft Publisher um, template as well that um, could be made available, and you know, with kind of the standard look and feel, and then fill in your your invasive species pictures and um, information. The the nice thing is because of everything else we do at the center, we have pictures of a lot of these species. We have short write-ups of a lot of these species and so <coughs> excuse me we're not having to build that from scratch we're just taking and copying and pasting from existing materials and formatting them with the logos so if the forest has that or if a local extension group has that then they're welcome to put their own information in it as well as their own logo on it um, and use anything that we've developed for for the project it seems like you might consider some standardized templates that could be um you know the pictures could be changed and the narratives could be changed but some very artistically oriented um, templates might be helpful for that um uh, thanks for for mike, for mike hurd who mentioned that the wilderness stewardship um, invasive species element requires data be entered into the tesp IS system. So, would you describe how wild spotter data gets translated into that particular database in the Forest Service? So, yeah, so at this point it hasn't yet. Um, but before we started anything, we had that conversation um, um, with Leonard Lake, I think was the contact um, at the time um of what exactly format needed to be and to make sure that everything we collected with wild spotter could be outputted in that format and um just because of the amount of data that's come through so far and um and them being busy with stuff we have it hasn't gone the other way but um if there's a need especially related to an assessment for um, some of the forests that have been more active making sure that data gets back to them, then that is absolutely something that um, that can happen because everything is completely compatible back and forth. Um, so all the information they need is in is in the wild spotter data. We've just got to, you know, export it in that format and, and send it to them to incorporate. Um, as the data flow becomes larger over time, then that's going to be automated with, uh, uh, um, it, you know, an, an API where it can just be pulled directly into their system. Yeah, I think that'll be essential or critical in order to encourage certainly agency folks to use it and to encourage the partners for the agency folks because that's that's the way they'll get credit for it uh, in the wilderness stewardship performance accounting system. And, and um, I think. That I think that the official answer to that part of what you said is that the Forest Service agency staff is supposed to use their um, existing data system to enter this stuff. And then what Wild Spotter could fill in the gap for is the volunteers who, who don't have access to the, um, to the existing data systems. I think right. that would be Mike, getting... Mike's answer if he was on. Yeah, we're getting several comments that say people are using Wild Spotter and they're um, entering the information by hand off of the Ed Maps. So having a, a way to do that seamlessly from the app into the Forest Service system through either an export function or direct would definitely be an improvement. I think save people time and energy. Yeah, um, and, and, and please send me, don't you know don't I would say don't do it that way. Let's make sure that we get the data to you electronically um, and, and to the system electronically. If there's enough of a need for that to happen, then we'll make that happen sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think that that's certainly something that I can suggest too to the wilderness program that 
uh, that be a connection that be worked on. And Mike should be aware of it. I think it would it will it will certainly encourage more people to use Wild Spotter if it can be a seamless entry into the the data system that they're required to use. Right. Um, one of the other questions here is it's a little bit broader than just the wild spotter app, but um, since you're an expert on the subject, um, would you talk a little bit about the connection between climate change and invasive species threats and and how volunteers could uh, better understand what that interaction is and, and understand kind of where wild spotter might fit into that? <laughs> Yeah, and 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 I I, um, I will say I, I'm definitely not not an expert on 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 climate change and and the impacts of invasives on um, related to climate change beyond just the the obvious that we know as as areas you know get warmer, um, especially that some of the species that were unable to survive previously are going to um, are going to extend their range, and uh, one of the things we've just added to um, to the EdMap site on a species level is um, a, a researcher took in for I think 800 plants. They did county level expansion based on um, based on predictive climate models, and so. What you can do now for, for most of the major invasive plant species is look at the EdMaps distribution of where we know this species is at the county level and then look at where, based on however many different models you choose, where it's predicted to expand or even to reduce um, based on climate change. And so um, if you go to EdMaps and you go to county maps, then then there's a, a couple of different options, and, and one of which are these um, range expansion maps. Um, yeah, again, at the species level, and so this is the first time that I've seen something done, and, and the reason we worked with the researcher at that large of scale, where they took all the existing distribution data, put it into the model, and then output it at a county scale so you can really get a feel on a national level of what the change may look like and and then incorporate however many different models you want to kind of refine that um, down to what one model says versus what I think it's up to 13 different models show. So that's definitely more of a tool for managers, um, but it's a tool to kind of show us that, you know, um, and there's more detail about how all that works on the on the website, but you know it, it's a good tool to show some of these problems that have been very regional problems are going to be much larger, and, and I think that's a again that carrot to help get more people involved in in doing something about um, on reporting these species so something can be done about them before they they really expand in their um, in their range. And so, you know, the, obviously if we were getting a million records in a year of invasive species on national forests, every one of those um, populations would not be able to be treated. But I, I think the benefit of having the reporting as part of the education um, of, of the public, of the users of, of these wild places <coughs> is what matters is not, you know, in the Southeast, another hundred acres of kudzu getting mapped. What matters is, you know, the Kogon grass infestation, the first one that's found in Tennessee and finding that and doing something about it before it spreads and becomes a problem like it is in Alabama and Florida right now. And so it's training, you know, to look for something that could be potentially invasive um, and, and identifying that new thing and reporting that new thing. And the more you get people involved in reporting, we've seen 
that that's when they're going to start going, oh, yeah, and I saw something that didn't quite look right, so I'm going to report it. Um, you know, the first report for a giant Asian hornet um, in Washington that was the first time I think found in in the U.S. Um, I don't I think it had been found in Canada before. Um, it, it came through the Washington Invasive Smartphone app because they've done so much marketing to the public ab about you know the problem of invasives and what you can do with it is is use this app that's then tied into to the EdMaps platform. And so you know Wild Spotter is just another piece of that, um, really targeting um, a different audience than what we've previously targeted with some of these campaigns. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. I'll Sorry, pause for a second. Dave, do you have any questions that you'd like to, to ask? Uh, Chuck, as a volunteer with no background in invasive species, I'm pretty good. I can usually tell poison ivy from lodgepole pine. <clears throat> but um, when, I, when I come to the Colorado thistles, I'm completely bollocksed. How can a volunteer who's interested in this program get some of the basic education so that we can be useful and put in data with a sense that maybe we got it right? Yeah, and, and I think that is, is where we have tried to work with the forest, that the, these initial forests, and as we continue to grow, we're going to continue to do this, is pick a, get the forest to choose, or the forest cooperators to choose a list of species of things that are easy to identify. <coughs> there's no, there's no way you're going to be able to, uh, you know, tell the difference between very similar grasses or very similar thistles. But if there's some easy wins that you can identify, as well as things that are common along with the things that are rare, then you feel like when you do map something, you're contributing without causing a problem for somebody. And then, you know, some of the really rare things are very easy to identify. And so keeping a short list and then being able to build upon that list as you become more familiar. And, and what we're trying to do is, you know, by building those um, the trailhead posters, I mean, that's really a good example of, you know, making <coughs> some very easy to identify species available. Um, and, and that could even be seasonally, seasonally that, okay, this is blooming this time of the year. Here's what you should be looking for. And if you see a purple flower, it's probably going to be this species versus the time of the years that they're dormant and you're not able to identify them as easy. Um, and, and having those little wins where, uh, you know, that, where, you know, in Colorado, the nice thing about it, um, in a state like Colorado, when you report something, it's not only going to go to the forest, it's also going to go to the Department of Ag. And they're probably going to follow up with you and say, hey, thanks for reporting. Um, you know, you, mis you, you misreported this, this is actually this, and, and provide you with some more information about what, what you did report. Um, and, and the states that are definitely more engaged into, um, into using EdMaps as their platform are the ones that we definitely would have more support for some of that um, already going on in the state. Thanks. Sorry, I all righty. No, no, that's quite all right. Well, Chuck, I'm just going to go ahead. We've uh, used up our hour, essentially. I just want to say thank you for your time and sharing with us and the wilderness stewardship community about the Wild Spotter app. We hope that it will encourage that this presentation will encourage some of the groups to go out and try it, download it, give it a shot, and see what um, it can do for you. Um, again, our next webinar will be on February 11th at 1 o'clock. We'll have Kevin Cannon talking about the use of volunteers in wilderness stewardship. Some of the key things for organizations to be thinking about the use of volunteers 
what they should do, what they shouldn't do, everything in between. So we look forward to having Kevin come back, recently retired from the Forest Service. With that, we'll go ahead and close our presentation today. Thanks again, Chuck, for coming. Thanks everybody for participating and being involved and we'll see everybody next week. Let's keep wilderness wild.